Well, good afternoon, and I want to welcome you to the sixth and final webinar in our collaborative heart failure series. My name is Sally May, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. I am with the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, which represents the states of Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. Our partner on this series of heart failure webinars is the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, which represents the three states of Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Both CLINs operate under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Improvement Organization Program. We are working within our seven states to reduce the 30-day hospital readmission rate by bringing organizations and communities together to improve the coordination of care between those healthcare settings and communities um, with the goal of reducing avoidable hospital readmissions. And heart failure is one of the major drivers of those readmissions, thus the reason for this series. We started the series back in June with a discussion about the basics of heart failure, including the pathophysiology and various treatment modalities. We have come full circle with today's focus on managing heart failure when care becomes comfort. Since all lines will be muted during the presentation, I encourage you to utilize chat, which is located on the right side of your screen, and not only to submit your questions, but also to respond to the questions that will be periodically posted throughout the presentation by my colleague, Jamie Stagg. So let's start with our first chat inquiry. What type of organization do you represent and in what state are you located? And while you are doing that, I will introduce today's speaker. Penny Weston has served as a health services nurse practitioner for Essentia Health in Fargo, North Dakota since 2011. She provides walk-in and urgent care services to patients from birth to adulthood at Essentia's seven-day clinic. Penny received her family nurse practitioner certificate and master of science degree from the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, North Dakota. She is certified as a family nurse practitioner and in gerontology both through the American Nurses Credentialing Center. Penny has served in various capacities in medical facilities, including long-term care administrator in both North Dakota and Ohio. Welcome, Penny. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Sally and Jamie, and welcome to the webinar today. Um, we'll just start with the, the housekeeping things, such as the objectives. Today, what I hope that um, we can discuss is congestive heart failure, and the management of the chronic symptoms that go along with that, which you've probably touched in other seminars as well, and identify the steps that you want to take in talking with the patient and family about end-of-life care. <clears throat> so first of all, what I like to do when I meet with a family, and more of my practice now is working in long-term care facilities. I do that two days a week, um, and I'm also seeing patients in transition and in their homes. So what we want to do when I get a patient, particularly in a skilled facility that comes in with congestive heart failure, is we backtrack. We talk about um, what congestive heart failure is, and I think this discussion on this slide right now is what we really need to have at the beginning of the diagnosis. People need to understand that congestive heart failure really is a terminal disease. We can't cure it. Um, half of all the people with di of this diagnosis will die within five years of their diagnosis. That's not really all that promising when you think about that. Um, some of the reasons that that is the statistic is because most of them have multiple comorbidities. Um, those of you that take care of elderly, I don't ever see somebody with congestive heart failure on their problem list that doesn't also have chronic kidney disease, usually diabetes, COPD, um, and a myriad of other comorbidities listed. Polypharmacy is also an issue, again, for many of these people. And why it's so important, in particular in primary care, is they're going to multiple specialists. And so all of those specialists are taking care of one organ. 
And for me, I have to be the person that pulls that story all together and really talks to them about what it means to look at their entire body because when you affect one organ system, it's going to have an impact on the others. And then another statistic that um, just to throw out there is um, preserved ejection, fracture, heart failure, there's no treatment that's actually been proven to alter the outcome of the disease process. So that's a little bit scary too when you think about that. So one of the things I think about is when we give someone a diagnosis or when they receive the diagnosis of dementia or Lou Gehrig's disease or MS or myriad of other diseases that we tend to accept and recognize as terminal, people have a lot of questions. What does that mean? What will it look like? What will happen to me down the road? And yet we don't have that discussion about congestive heart failure. And many of us, I'm sure, have been in the situation where when it gets to that point, it becomes really a concern for family and for patients. Next slide. So setting expectations. One of the first things I do with the family after they're admitted and I look at their problem list is talk to them about the disease process just very general again. They've been to the CHF clinics. They've had lots of education, but now I want to go back over with them what do they understand the etiology of the disease process? Not just for their congestive heart failure, but what does it mean for their kidney failure? Because when we alter the medications for their heart, a lot of those are going to impact their kidney function. And so we have to be careful how we manage those. And there's choices that need to be made about what medications we can give. The other thing is then we talk about the diagnosis, what that is, the treatment expectations. What are they thinking um, is left for them for treatment. What have they been through? So I understand how much they've already done as far as treating and how aggressive they've been. And then I always, usually I'm one of the first people that really talks to them about the overall prognosis of the disease that they have. And sometimes for them, this is really an eye-opening experience because no one has really talked to them about the fact that they can die from heart failure. Um, so sometimes, believe it or not, that is a surprise to them. And then the next slide. I have a video here that I, I think is important to watch because most of you have probably been in this situation where patient ends up in the hospital, nobody's really talked about this, and this is kind of what happens to the patient when you're in a crisis mode. So I want you to see this. So Jamie, be before we show this um, video, so where are folks from and what organizations are they representing? Uh, that is a good question, Sally. We have, uh, we're fortunate today to have some broad representation in our, in our participants. Um, it looked like we had uh, representation from all seven states uh, and beyond with uh, people from a, a wide uh, diversity of settings, including clinics, long-term care, uh, EMS, home health, um, hospitals, both critical access and, and large academic institutions, and uh, transitional care I saw as, as well, TCUs. So uh, some pretty good representation. So are you seeing my screen, Jamie? I'm just checking. Yes. Okay. Can't tell you what I really want. You can only guess what it feels like. And right now it's a steel knife in my windpipe. I can't breathe, but you still fight, cause you can fight. As long as the wrong sounds right, protocol type. How the drugs charge the day? I'm like a pin cushion, I hate it. I'm all suffer. I suffocate right before I'm about to die. You were just a date. Me, you think you saved me, and I hate it. Wait, let me go, I'm leaving you. No, I ain't. Who is that you put it right back? I'm a machine, a man now, I'm in a cage, ain't no advance to break up, I'm just going shit. 
When you put them to say, let's look and dine But you just don't want to let them be at peace Cause you miss them already, but they ain't gonna be beat But better later or long, I swore I'd never harm them Never do nothing to hurt them, Hippocratic Oath Dream them, I'm not so right now I'm forced Just to torture them, big wish, full code No one knows what it wishes for It's just to hurt them, say one I don't want to be a vegetable When no one agrees in the family The caregiver gave both of them for care But it's clear, look so far away Batter guilt, just feel like a cancer So she answers, wait Think you'll wake? Now yeah, you ain't even in the state. Palliate, relieve pain, get him home and play. Critical care is hypocritical when it's so insane. But they insist I shop your part against the walk of this. I guess that's why they say that love is pain. Just gonna stay. Okay, so as Sally gets the next um, slide up there, one of the things I saw that me way too many times, and particularly when I was an administrator in a nursing home as well, and so I've been a nurse for a long time, it was really some of the things that I felt passionately about and why I went back to um, NP school very late in my life, um, to try to make a difference and make sure that this doesn't happen, especially to my family. So advanced care planning is something that's very near and dear to my heart, um, and I spend a lot of time in the nursing home having care conferences with families. And so one of the things that if we have a patient that comes in that we've kind of ha had this experience already that we just watched and we know that has occurred, then I usually will talk to the staff and ask them, you know, what are you hearing, what are they thinking, and I ask to set up a care conference with that family as soon as we possibly can. I talk to the patient about who do they want to be there, who's, it, who's important for them to have to be there, not the care takers, not their family makers, but, or family members, but who does this, the patient want to be there. Um, try to have it in a comfortable setting, not in their room, but maybe in a family room, someplace where we have a large block of time blocked out because you never know how long these conversations are going to take until you get in the middle of them. Always have lots of Kleenex. Sometimes it's for me too. The other thing that I found very helpful is I pull up the medical record. Now with Epic and computers, I can have that whole entire medical record right in front of me. So I have access to their hospital chart, which a lot of times I think is very important because I've usually gone in and read the specialist notes, I've read the therapist notes, and I kind of have an idea what the bigger picture looks like. Um, oftentimes it will be written very clearly in the record from some of my medical colleagues that, you know, the prognosis is very poor and, you know, they've talked to the family, but the family doesn't always hear what we tell them. So having seen what's in the record, I at least have some background going into that meeting. The other reason why I think it's very, very important to have the medical record there is because they don't know me from Adam when they meet me. And when I go in to visit with them, I want to be able to read the reports right out of the chart to them and then go through and explain what that means in language they can understand so that it begins to help them um, have more concrete information. I always do a pre-huddle again, like I talked about with the facility staff to see um, what are they hearing, and usually it's within the first week with the people that have been there, especially if we're talking about feeding tubes or any of those things. So we kind of have the pre-huddle so we can plan ahead of time where we think some of our snafus might be or what some of the questions may be that come up. Next slide. During that care conference, then, it's really important for me to go back and find out um, what do they know? What have they been told? And so the first thing I always ask them is, 
While you were at the hospital, what were you told about your condition? What did the doctors tell you about what happened to get you to the hospital? And what did they tell you about when you get out what you can expect? And sometimes it's really interesting because it's nothing like what the chart says. So it kind of gives you a point of reference of where to start. And then I'll ask them, what do you think about that? What do you think about what they told you? I've often found that people that, and I'm sure this is not new to a lot of you, but I've often found that people really know how sick they are, but they've nobody's asked them what they think. And so a lot of times this might be the opportunity for them for the first time to say to their family, I'm not going to get better, or I don't think I'm going to get better, so I don't know that I want to do that again. So by giving them the opportunity and asking, what do you think about all this? And I usually sometimes have to interrupt family members and say, now this is really for your mom or your dad or your brother or whoever to talk about. I want him to be able to tell us what he thinks or she thinks. Um, affirm the care that they've already provided and the decisions they've already made. This is really hard when you start talking about things didn't go well in the hospital and they made decisions to maybe do some procedures and it didn't come out the way they wanted. And they start to second guess themselves and think, I wish I wouldn't have done that to them. I wish I wouldn't. The wishes won't change anything. So it's really important to confirm or affirm them and let them know that they made really good decisions at the time with the information they had. There's nothing wrong with any decision they made and we just need to look at what do they want to do now coming forward. Um, I think it's very important to communicate the prognosis. Um, I usually will sit down with a family and I usually tell them, you know, one thing that you don't know me, but one thing that I will assure you is that, number one, I will never lie to you, and number two, I will always tell you the truth, even if it's not what you want to hear. So that hopefully I walk that talk so that when something comes up, I am honest with them. And that is another reason why I have the medical record there, because I think that establishes trust with them that I'm, because there's kind of this um, concept that the medical record is the secretive thing that you lock away and we don't let families or anybody see it because we're afraid we're going to get sued. I tend to look at the medical record as it's a way for me to share their information that they should already know and to show them that I'm not afraid to tell them what's in there. And I always let them know that if I don't give you all the information, you truly cannot make an informed decision. So even if it's information that you're not going to be happy to hear about or it's going to be uncomfortable to hear about, I'm going to tell you the truth, and you can expect that from me every single time. Um, we talk about the goals of care, what what were they thinking their goals would be, um, where are they at in this process, and a lot of times that will change within the first couple of weeks um, as they are able to process the information. And again, one more time to ask them, what did they hear the, the providers say when they were in the hospital? What did they hear the kidney doctor say when he was there? So usually with congestive heart failure, they're in with the um, nephrology, and nephrology and cardiology, it seems like don't often read each other's notes. And so I ask them, well, what did the nephrologist tell you about this? Well, did the cardiologist tell you what that decision means for your heart? Or, or we can keep your kidneys alive for five more years, but can your heart stay alive for five more years? Because if you don't know the big picture, you're not able to make good decisions. And the last thing I do um, when we visit is I provide them with my information, how they can get a hold of me. Um, I'm on call to my facilities 24 hours a day, and so I let them know if they need to talk to me, that just let the facility know. They will call me. I can get their phone number. I'll call them back. I try to set up a time if they want to meet face-to-face. -face. Oftentimes, after we've had this initial care conference, because it's pretty brutally honest, they will ask me to meet again with some family members that maybe weren't able to be there, or maybe that's when you start finding out they're not all on the same page. And um, they want me to be able to relay the honest information to that family member, and it takes them out of the role of being the bad guy 
and um, having them not be believed by their family. Okay, next slide. I just threw this slide in here because congestive heart failure in the nursing home, by the time people are ill enough that they're in a skilled nursing facility, um, we, we should all have been at least thinking about palliative care. And again, I think talking about palliative care, and I like to call it personal power care, um, is because it's something that um, for any type of diagnosis like this, we should let people know that they do have choices and they will as their disease process moves along. So it's gonna optimize their quality of life by trying to look ahead to what might happen and preventing those things from happening and making sure that they don't suffer and they don't have pain. That's usually people's biggest fear. Um, that we're gonna look at everything, their physical, their intellectual, emotional, social, and their spiritual needs. And I think why it's important that we talk about this at the very beginning of the diagnosis, because this will change um, as they go. And we have to always kind of keep it on the forefront so that we make sure that we're looking at it, we're asking those questions, and we're not getting caught up in other things besides the patient. Um, palliative care or personal power care, um, helps them facilitate their autonomy, um, access to information, and their choice of treatment options. I have been more than one time chastised by um, sometimes some hospitalists, and it's not because they're not good people and they're not trying to take care of the patient, but sometimes we're on two different pages. And part of it is just from our point of reference and where we're coming from, um, and I, I resort back every single time to try to go back to the family and back to the patient and really challenge us all as healthcare providers to say, has anybody really talked to the patient? Is this really what they want? Um, other times also, we don't just need to go to their advanced directive when they're on death's door. I think it's good to go to that advanced directive, especially with the family when they're in the earlier stages of a disease process because it's something we can pull the family back to all the time and say, as we're nearing the point where, you know, somebody maybe is looking at having to go on dialysis, as we're nearing that point, what did they say in their advanced directive when they made that 10 years ago that they wanted? And is that really what they want? And sometimes they don't really know it's a choice because we tend to just do what, um, the healthcare pro provider and community tell us to do. So sometimes we have to pull that out and look at it and go back and talk to the patient. And I'll bring it out and say, you know, way back when you made this, one of the things you said you wanted is you didn't want ever want to be hooked up to a machine. What does that mean to you? And oftentimes they'll still remember and they'll still be able to tell you what that meant. And now we can talk about that decision they made then in reference of the information they have today. And so when we're talking about, yeah, you might need dialysis down the road, what do they think about that? Before we get them down the track and the trains derailed and left the station about now we have to get you on dialysis because your kidneys aren't working and we still haven't looked at the fact that your heart's not that good either. Next slide. Other things that I really talk um, to my patients in the um, skilled nursing facility about, and oftentimes when I do annual wellness visits with my patients in the clinic, um, we have that discussion about what are their goals. And early on, depending, no, it doesn't really matter what their diagnosis is, um, we talk about the dreaded question that everybody promised their family they'd never put them in a nursing home. I hope to God nobody still does that. But we talk about what what will happen or what do you think at the point that you get to that? Or we're at the point where we're really talking to the family about it's time to place them in a setting where they can get additional care, particularly the skilled services they need um, to monitor their disease process and keep them out of the hospital. So I ask them when they get to the nursing home, what is your goal? Is your goal to go home? Are you here for rehab? Because everybody discharged from the hospital's goal is to rehab. We get them in therapy and we do all those things, and that's true. We don't want to take that hope away. But usually relatively soon when we talk to the family and we look at what's been going on in their home, have they had falls, um, are they eating appropriately, 
you know, are they dressed appropriately when they come to see them? And we start to look at maybe rehab is not realistic. And if we know that up front, we don't have to take that hope away, but we can begin to start helping them look at what their needs are a little sooner. Um, what about hospital if they come in? One of the first things I do is we discuss their code level, and there's many, many times that I will get a code level changed when they first move in because we've really asked them what they wanted. Um, and then I ask them about that, lab work. Do you want lab work done anymore? Um, we talk about if I do lab work and there's something off, then there's an expectation I'm going to either A, try to fix it, or um, B, give you one more medication in the pile of 12 that you already have, and is that something that you really want? Um, I probably have a little bit different philosophy than a lot of people. I'm all for the quality indicators, and you have to do your diabetic labs and all those things. I think there's a time and a place for that. But I also think there's a time and a place when someone's um, medical conditions are no longer curable that it doesn't make sense to chase labs. And one of my common ones is um, BMPs because when we give people diuretics and things to keep their CHF under control and you get a BMP, their creatinine is sky high and their GFR is horrible and everybody starts freaking out about that. So I talk to the family about that, and I just tell them, you know, we can treat the symptoms and keep him comfortable or her comfortable, but if we continue to do labs every time, we're going to be chasing lab work and not necessarily the patient. So I let them know, in order to keep them comfortable, we're going to have to give them medication that will kind of impact their kidneys. And that might mean their kidneys don't last as long as maybe they would have. But in order to manage the symptoms and keeping them comfortable, it may come to that. And so then we talk about, do you really want lab work done? Because sometimes families will hold on to that as well. And you get a BMP and somebody was really good about educating them about um, not taking their or Advil and all that stuff because it'll wreck their creatinine and their GFR, and so now they know those numbers, so they tend to want to draw those so they can monitor those numbers, thinking that's going to tell them how close they are to dying. So it's more education with that. Other thing to ask yourself is, would you be surprised if the patient died in one year? That's kind of the barometer for me that tells me um, what, what I need to do to work with the family. If I'm not surprised that they're going to probably die in one year, that to me is when we really have to look at um, helping them get the best quality of life they can. And I ask them, what does quality versus quantity mean to them? Um, it's oftentimes very different for every family member as well. So it's important for me to make sure that I have discussions with the patient completely away from the family. And I let them know that whatever we talk about is um, confidential, that I don't go out and tell their family everything they tell me. Um, we talk about what are the things that you wish your family knew but you're afraid to tell them. And oftentimes that's when they will tell me, I'm tired, I don't want to do this anymore but they want me to get chemo. They want me, you know, they want me to do this, but I'm just tired. And so I have in the past asked them, do you want me to tell your family that for you? And they're very grateful and they cry and they said, oh, that would be so wonderful. And so I set that up. I call them and tell them, you know, I want to visit with you about your parent or your loved one. And I let them know that we talked about what they really want and that, their loved one loves them so much, they don't want to hurt them, but this is really where they're at. And let's talk about what that means for you guys now, because you're, we now know what they want, and this is going to be the hardest thing you have to do, but how can we support that decision for your loved one? Medications, I am a minimalist. Um, if you are in the nursing home, there is literature out there that tells you after 75 statins and all those things, maybe, yes, they can make a difference, but there's also side effects to all those medications as well. Um, 
I love my food, so I already have my care plan ready for when I go to the nursing home, and chocolate is on there no matter what um, disease I have. But I also look at if they're not eating well, if their appetite is poor, and we're dumping a bunch of supplements into their stomach, that's not helping the situation any. Um, most, many of you have probably either seen or taken care of patients that you put on hospice services. We get rid of all their medications because they're quote unquote non-essential and all of a sudden they get better. So I think, I'm a firm believer that medications, um, the less you have, the better it is. Um, so some of those, and I know as a skilled facility it's hard because you have to look at falls. They're supposed to be on calcium and vitamin D, and then you want them on a multivitamin, and then they have a pressure ulcer, and you want them to heal, so you've got to put them on a protein supplement. And, again, we're, we're adding a bunch of things to treat disease processes that the body is naturally saying, I can't fix it anymore. So we really look at medications and what that means and talk about risks versus benefits, especially for things like statin medications um, and those kinds of things. Devices, um, that's one that I throw out there as well when I have somebody that comes in with a device, um, internal cardiac defibrillator. I can't think of anything worse in my mind than if your heart starts failing more. The, the goal of the or the treatment is to have that thing fire and go off. But if you've ever talked to anyone that's had it fire and go off, it is not a pleasant experience. So I talk about that right up front and say, you know, at some point in time, if you're ready to talk about do you want to shut it off, and again, I don't make them make that decision, but I just throw it out there that it's something they really do have a choice about, um, about turning off that defibrillator. Um, because as their heart rhythm may be, heart gets worse and their rhythm becomes more um, sporadic, they have a higher likelihood of having that fire. And unfortunately, not every, I mean, most people don't always die when that goes off, and so it's not comfortable. We also talk about pacemakers and what that means. Um, families, I found, have a real fear that if they don't turn off the pacemaker, um, their loved one will never die, and it will just make them very uncomfortable. Um, and I try to explain to them that a pacemaker, again, depending on how it's set, but a pacemaker can't keep a really sick heart going. Um, so we talk about that. However, if it's really important to them that they have that um, pacer turned off, uh, we look at that. Or when they're getting the battery life checked, and I just had this happen to me not too long ago. We had this little... 92-year-old lady, cute as a bug, and she had her cardiac pacemaker checked, and it said she had 11 months left of her battery life. So we have to talk to her family about that. Do you, do you really want her to go in and have this replaced, and they want to know what that meant, and does that mean at 11 months and zero hours that it's just going to quit right there? And no, it didn't. So lots of questions, again, that they – haven't thought about to ask or they're afraid to ask. So we go back in and we talk about those things as well. Okay, next slide. If you have not read this book, you should not be in healthcare until you do. Uh, Atul Gawande, Being Mortal, I'm hoping most of you have read it, so this is kind of a repeat. He is a surgeon, actually, and his parents were both physicians. His father developed... Um, a chronic condition, cancer, and um, was dying. And it talks about his journey through that process with not only his father, but also with some of his patients and how he treated them and didn't really look at giving them options of not treatment because that's not really what we're trained to do when we go into healthcare. So he says in his book, what to say or ask the patients. And this is kind of a repeat of what we've already talked about. Do they know the prognosis? If you cannot answer this question for that family member honestly, you need to know that and you need to be able to find somebody that can because I think you are doing a big disservice if you can't be honest with them about that. And that doesn't mean you're a bad provider or a bad person. Not everybody is comfortable with those conversations. And so you need to team up with somebody that is them. Um, what are their fears? 
about what's to come. I think that's an important one of asking them, what are you afraid of? Um, what, what worries you both or most about the care going forward? For some people, it's, I'm afraid I won't be able to breathe and I don't want to feel like I, I can't breathe. For some, it'll be, I don't want to feel in pain. Um, it's different for everybody, but I think it's important to ask the question so that we know what that is and we can anticipate when we see that coming. Um, what are your goals? What do you like to do? You know, what do you want to do with the time you have left? Because depending on what that is, you might have to get that bucket list going tomorrow if it's something that might take a while to accomplish, or you can maybe wait a while. But I think it's important to have that conversation. I think it also allows the patient and family to process that and begin the journey towards end of life. Um, what are the trade-offs you're willing to make? How much suffering are you still willing to go through for the possibility of added time? And I think this is really important, again, for chemotherapy, for dialysis, um, especially dialysis. Um, we tell people that, you know, this will take care of your kidneys and everything, but we don't tell them what that really means. They just think what they see on TV. They, you go in, they hook you up in this machine, everybody laughs, you have a little lunch, you go home. They don't realize that you're worn out, you're tired, you don't feel well, you're nauseated oftentimes, and dialysis isn't always fun for people. And especially if you're 80 or 90 years old and you don't feel good anyway, and now we're going to take you and hook you up out of your comfort zone, out of your own place, um, several times a week. So I think that's important to talk to them about. Um, next slide. Bucket list care. What's their heart's desire? Again, same things. And I'm going to kind of use an example here. I had a patient who, um, his name is John, and I've gotten permission from his family to talk about him. John lived in my nursing home, and he had two other gentlemen that um, they got together every Saturday. They were bison football lovers. And they got together every Saturday to watch the bison football game, and they took turns buying the beer. And they'd have a beer and watch the football game, and they just had a great time. It meant the world to them. Well, one of them died during the summertime. And that fall, there was just two of them together. And John was not doing as well, and I noticed a change in his personality. Um, he was on dialysis. He had congestive heart failure. He had diabetes, so he'd already lost um, his leg. He was a Vietnam vet. Um, and he was starting to ask to be disconnected from dialysis early, he, or he wouldn't go to his treatments, or he'd refuse a day. And that was very different for him. So I went in and I talked to him, and I said, John, what are you thinking? I said, what's going on? Because I said, you're, you know, I see that this is happening more often. Um, I said, are you done? Do you want to be done with dialysis? And he looked at me, and he said, all you're going to do is try to talk me into going again. And I said, no, I'm not. I really want to know, what do you want? If you don't want to go to dialysis, then you don't have to go to dialysis. And we'll keep you comfortable. I promise we'll keep you comfortable. And he said, you know, I don't know if I really want to go anymore. So we didn't talk about it. But I that gave me a hint that things maybe aren't going to last very long for him. So it was important to me to get John and his roommate to a football game, a bison football game, so we moved heaven and earth, and we did get two Bison football tickets. And actually, um, Chase Morlock, for those of you that are Bison fans, his father was dying at the same time. But he gave up his um, tickets, football tickets, on homecoming day so these two gentlemen could go to the football game. So they were so excited. Um, the look in their eyes when we went in to tell them that we actually got them tickets to a football game. They got new shirts. Um, the day of the football game, I was supposed to meet them at noon to take them in um, to the to the stadium, into the Fargo Dome, and I got a call from the facility, and they said, uh, did you tell them you would take them tailgating? And I said, uh, I might have. Why? Because they changed their ride, and they told them that Penny said she'd take us tailgating, so we're going tailgating. So I said, yep, not a problem. So we brought them up there. We took them to our tailgating spot. Thank God it was close to the dome. And we gave them a beer, and they had some 
popcorn and horrible things for their diet. And we went to get ready to go into the dome. And this whole experience to me was, it was a God thing. Because as we're getting ready to go into the dome, the band walked by right in front of them. And they said, oh, we want to stay and listen to the band. And it's like, of course you can stay and listen to the band. So they were excited about that. We got them in there. We got them set up, um, got them snacks, the foam fingers, the whole thing. And it was a blowout ball game. So um, I went over there about five minutes left of the game, and I said, okay, guys, are you ready to go? Um, I called, the ride is here. We can take you out. And there's hardly anybody left in the stadium. And they said, no. We want to watch the whole game. So they stayed until the last second ticked off the clock. And we got them in the van and we took them home. And there was nothing that made my heart feel better um, to see John happy as well. And on Tuesday when I got up to get ready to go to the nursing home again to make rounds, I got a phone call from the facility. And they told me that they said John died. And I said, John who? They said, you're John. Your John died. And I, I thought, well, he wasn't that sick. I mean, what happened? How could that be? So by the time I got there, his family was there, and his roommate was there, who was the guy that went with him to the football game. And he said, you know, all he talked about was being able to go to that football game. And his wife said, I can't tell you how important that was to us. And to me, that's like, when will you know it's time? I knew that John was getting close to time. And John couldn't come right out and tell me he was done. But allowing him to think about it and for me to know that it's time to start working on his bucket list because he might not have time to do it himself was important. And that was in, to me, that still was, that was God working in great mysterious ways, that we got tickets, that we got them there, that um, all of that happened. The stars were aligned. So I think, again, that's important so that you can do those things because it was great closure for his family. Um, it was great for me to be able to see that happen and to be a part of that. Um, next slide it talks a little bit about references and I think um, now we can do Jamie do you want to do some questions now or do you want to go to the, the next video and then questions here's a couple of little people with their hearts desire it's not too hard to find a horse or a cow in North Dakota so you can get that done and the next slide was kind of neat when I was looking through information for this is this little couple had been married for 70 years, and his wish was he just wanted to be by his wife's side when she died because they'd been together forever. So I hats off to our TCUs and our skilled facilities who are way eons ahead of most of our hospitals in making things happen um, for people to be together and making their wishes come through true for them. So, we next have a video that we'll show, but Jamie, what are what's the chatter that you've been seeing in the chat? Well, we uh, we have a, a group I think that was in, intensely listening to everything that uh, Penny had to share because it's been kind of uh, kind of a little quiet in the chat. We've had a, a few comments regarding um, advanced directives for those. Uh, with CHF. Um, out, outside of that, that's about it, Sally. Okay. You know, I I have a question for you, Penny. Yep. You know, um, when, how would do you envision if someone is told that they have heart failure, and let's say we have the maybe the 70 year old um, in the office with maybe primary care or the cardiologist. How would you draft it? Would, if it was going to be a perfect exchange, how would how would you structure that? Usually, what I do, and I like to work in concert with our congestive heart failure clinic, because again, I think that we all need to really work as a team, and we all need to be on the same page for that. So, 
I get them set up with congestive heart failure. I also then get them back in with me, and we talk about, okay, now you have a diagnosis of congestive heart failure. Kind of go through the same thing with them in the office, but in a much quicker way. The most important thing of all of that, I think, as their primary care provider is to tell them, number one, if you ever have a question or don't understand something that um, one of the other specialists has told you, you need to come and see me. And we're going to talk about what that means. And I'm going to tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly um, about what that is, too. Because I think sometimes they think that, um, well, I think sometimes they're not told how bad it is. So they're going through, you know, life thinking everything's great and things are going to get better. And yet we know they're not. And I think it's important for them to understand that, you have to preserve what you have because it's not coming back. And that sometimes I think we don't talk to them about. We know that, but I don't think we tend to put it out there that way for them. So that's kind of how I set that up is talk about, you know, we have this disease. Um, here's what the statistics say. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be here in five years. But if you have five years left to live, what do you want that to look like? What kind of medicine do you want? What kind of care do you want? Um, because I tell them, as your care provider, I advocate for you. So I need to know if you end up in the ER and I get your chart note on Monday morning and I look at what's happening to you in the hospital, i got to kind of know if that's what you want. And if it's not, I am obligated to you to go to the hospital and talk to your care team to get us all back on the same page. That's my commitment to you as your primary care provider. Um, well, Penny, I think you just kind of set the stage for this video that we're now going to show. And um, like the previous video, the link is here on the slide. So for those of you that would be interested in using this in your facility, it is available to do that. So let's go ahead and see the second one. And again, I think this one's important because this one tells you, if you've watched the Bucket List movie, um, when I saw the video again in this different context, especially in contrast to the first one, this is what I want to be able to do with my life, to make my decisions. Okay, here we go.
So hopefully those of you that um, can, for me that was very empowering, especially when you look at the beginning and what we do and at the end how most of us, I think, would want to have the opportunity to decide what we do with the time we have left. Well, speaking of the time that we have left, we actually have a few minutes available for questions. Um, you may um, ask them either via the phone um, using star six to unmute your line or and then also star six to remute your line, or you may enter your um, question into chat. Um, Jamie, um, uh, what kind of responses have you been seeing just recently? I know there has been some dialogue going on. Uh, it seems like uh, people have uh, been thankful for the sharing and, and presentation from Penny today, and, and um, that uh, some enjoyed the, the video that was just shared. So, are there any questions um, on the phone? Oh, here I will. I will also change this to question. And Okay. If if someone would prefer to ask a question uh, via the phone, you can push star six to uh, unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Well, I just I want to um, thank you, Penny, for um, sharing um, your stories your valuable insight of really helping individuals um, develop what their goals of care might be. And I think just having that frank and honest conversation is so helpful to not only the patient but to their families as well to give them realistic expectations and really determine and really get to the point of what is it that I want? 
what makes a good day for me? What do I want to accomplish? And and really having that frank conversation really gives them that opportunity and the freedom to really make those kind of plans. Um, evidently, we're not getting um, the phone line sounds rather quiet, <laughs> and I'm we're not. Getting... I. My name is Mary, and I had typed okay. in. If you could please reshow the slide with the link for the resources, not the videos, the resources. Okay, you want me to, re to show you that slide? Yes, please. Okay, sure, we can do that. It's back. No back yep. There you go. Okay. Oh, nope, Oops. it is too, yep, go right. back I went, way. I was going, I was going too quickly. There, there we go. you go. That's yep. what I wanted. All right, good. We we also have a question from a, a nurse asking about how um, recommendations for how to get the physician on board about goals of care at the end of life. Um, sometimes you have to be a dog with a bone, and I'm not afraid to do that. And again, um, we aren't always on the same page, but the way I look at it, and I have a unique advantage in that I am also a primary care provider as well as provider for Essentia in the skilled facility. Um, I've spent a lot of time trying to develop relationships with uh, my other primary care colleagues so that I feel that when I go in, if there's a hospital situation happening that's not going the way that I know the patient might want or whatever. It's, it really is my job to go in and try to explain to them why the goals are what they are for the patient, why we have the discussion, when we have the discussion. Um, and I'll just give you one example. We had a patient that had congestive heart failure and she was in the hospital for 90 days. And nobody could place her. She was um, foreign-born. She didn't speak good English. Um, she was very non-compliant, all of those things. She had a court-appointed guardian. And we talked about why she was non-compliant and all of those things. And we said, you know, really, she's telling us she doesn't want that kind of care. So our goal was then going to be to bring her back to the facility on hospice. And I had a knockdown, dragout fight with a hospitalist who actually um, – accused his court appointed guardian of trying to kill her. Um, we got through that, we got her back, we put her on hospice, we deactivated her defibrillator, and 10 months later she's still alive and she has not been back in the hospital. Prior to that, she'd been in there 25 times in two years. Jamie, are there any other questions? Thank you, Penny. Are there any other questions in chat? Not at this time. Okay. All right. So, Penny, I just want to thank you for sharing your valuable insight on caring for heart failure patients and closing out our heart failure series in such a meaningful way. This session was recorded and will be available in about two weeks on both the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network and the Lake Superior um, Quality Innovation Network websites, as noted on um, the slide. Um, this presentation has been approved for one contact hour by the North Dakota Board of Nursing. Um, to receive a certificate of completion, please complete the evaluation that will pop up when you leave the webinar. Once you have completed the evaluation, you will receive a certificate of completion. For sites with multiple people in the room, the site coordinator will receive a follow-up email in the next day or two inviting you to forward the evaluation link to others who wish to receive the continuing education credit as appropriate. As always, we appreciate your feedback on today's session. Um, so I want to thank all of you for participating in today's call and I wish you a great holiday season. And this concludes today's session um, and our heart failure series. Thank you. Have a good day.